Yes, OK, I'm going to um, go to current students and then log into my in mic that way because that's a very quick way to log in. And then username and password. OK, and from here. Um, FYI, you can you can uh, reach your NWAC email here by clicking on mail. Uh, Success Planner is also available in Canvas and I'm going to Canvas right now. And I'm going to our combined class. And here's the first page you see. And that's probably what you see when you go there, including the links. Let me make this a little smaller so you can see more. The uh, the links to this class are there and um, uh, the link to my help time is here and I have just published my help times. They're in syllabus. right there. So those are my official stated help times um, with a typo right there. It's not 8 to 1030. It's 9 to 1030 here on Wednesday. That would cut right into my class. I don't think they'd like that, but I have two hours left over to uh, to use for appointments. So if these times aren't good for you, I can certainly meet you at some other time by Microsoft uh, Teams. Let's see, last night. I uh, sent you this announcement. Just to point it out to you, link to Teams. Well, everybody here is on Teams or you wouldn't be here. Um, Let's see, you'll need a link to our class. Yes, there it is, but I also made an introductory video. It's not the best video in the world, but it will show you around and, and show you what you need to know and how to access it. My hope was, you know, to, to help people who are new, new to NWAC and, uh, you know, kind of give them a foot up. Yeah, what's in the syllabus is very important. The extremely important facts about the class, um, the class assignment schedule, I have finished up through the first five weeks. Notice your exam here is on the fourth week. You're going to want to read this. Not right now, but later. All you have to do is click on it. Uh, help times, how to use uh, first day and how to register in my NWAC. You should have received your emails from Barnes & Noble already, but this is an extra help, especially for people who registered too late to get their Barnes & Noble letter, email rather. Okay, and how to use ProctorU. So there are a series of links there. ProctorU is something that comes up automatically when you take the exam. You don't have to go there. OK, so um, I also wanted you to know that modules exists in modules. There's a week one module, week two modules. What those are going to contain is uh, the notes I use during our class meetings and the videos I make. I record all of our class meetings so you can go back and um, uh, study them, help them, help them help you do the homework. OK, so I leave that to you to read through. I know you know how to read. 
And what I am going to do now is go to our homework, which is right here. Um, I saved it as a PDF and uh, your notes will be on this sheet. So those will be the first step because I have to edit out students from the uh, uh, videos. That is, uh, your names appear at the bottom and because uh, I, I want to protect your identities, what I do is I go through and I edit and cover up, cover up your names so that no one can see them. And let me know if for some reason that's not working. All right, here we go. So it takes longer for the videos to get up than it takes for the notes to get up. But um, I try to always get them up the same day, and I almost always do. Okay, so I know this is going back to the deep past, uh, but that's what review is for. And so we're going to be reviewing linear functions, which are straight lines and um, <clears throat> points and how to graph and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse to drink more coffee. OK. So first, let's look at points. OK, here are four points and what you're asked to do is find which graph shows the proper placement for all four points and not everybody is up on graphing. So let's do it. A is the point three comma one. So what that means is the easiest way to explain it is to start if you're graphing to start at the center of the graph and go this many places. Whoop. There. Go this many places horizontally and this many places vertically. A negative in front of the number on the left here means go to the left. And uh, not having a negative means a positive. It means you go to the right. Um, for this number that correlates with the vertical axis, it's a positive one, so you're going to go up one. A negative one would take you down one. So the first number gives you the sideways movement, and the second number gives you the up and down movement in order to get to a point. So the point three, one, we'll get to by starting at the center, going to the right three units and going up one and making a dot there. Okay, B is negative nine, two. That means I start at the center and I go to the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then up Two, one, two. Notice I don't actually put a dot until I've gone in both directions. So I don't put a dot there except maybe accidentally. Um, I go sideways and then up and put my dot. Sideways and then up and put my dot. C is zero negative five. That means I started the center and I go zero to the left or right. That means I stay on the Y axis. And then the negative five in the Y position means that I go down five units. So, um, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. So this point is actually going to be on the y-axis, and when a point is on the y-axis, we call it the y-intercept. 
And then finally, D is two, negative three. So I start at the center and I go two to the right and three down. And then make my dot. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four. All I have to do is find the point, is find the graph that looks like this one. And here it is right here. B looks exactly like this. More colorful, but exactly like that. Stop me if you have any questions. Okay, now we're going to determine if a point is a solution of the equation. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean, they, the people who wrote the book, the people who wrote the question, what they're asking, what is being asked is, is this point on this line? That's what being a solution of the equation. A line is given to you as an equation because there's an equal sign right there. You've got y equals 2x minus 3. So is the point 1, negative 1 on there? A quick way to do it is to, is to figure it out, is to write y equals 2x minus 3. And then recognize that over here from this point, x equals positive one and y equals negative one. That's what is going on in that point right there. So I'll come over here and I'll put a negative one in for the y and a positive one in for the x. Hmm. And so I'll have negative one equals two minus three, which is negative one. So I end up with negative one equals negative one. And that's true. So what that means is the point one, negative one, is indeed one of the many points on this line. All lines have an infinite number of points. One negative one is just one of those points. But we found out for sure it is on the line. So the point one negative one here is or is not, is a solution of the equation. Yes, it is is a solution of the equation because when, okay, I had to read all of this, is substituted for x. Well, okay, one is substituted for x. My attempt at writing a one. And blank is substituted for y. Well, uh, that's gonna be negative one. The result is a true, see the number there, is a true equation. In other words, the left side equals the right side, so it's true. That's our little proof. Okay, now, take you down memory lane, why equals 2x minus 3 is a line in slope intercept form. Let me stop and say that you are free to go through the homework as fast as I can get it up. You'll be able to take the chapter exams early and the practice exams. The practice exams do count for your grade, okay? 
you'll read that if you read that most important information or if you read the syllabus that I'm going, the whole syllabus that I have to upload as one document. So really it's all the separate handouts in Canvas syllabus that are put together for the sake of the secretary of the math department. She wants them all together as one document, so I give that to you also. OK. OK, well, anyway, this is slope intercept form. And um, uh, yeah, here's the slope. Remember, it's called M. Here's the Y intercept, it's called B. And actually your Y intercept is the point zero, Y intercepts always have a zero in front, and then this number three with a negative sign in front of it. Remember that the formula for the slope intercept form is Y equals M X plus B. And so here we have Y equals two, the slope is two, X plus negative three. Except we don't write it like this, we write it like this because it just looks more normal. This 2x minus y equals 5 is not in slope intercept form. You don't have to put it in slope intercept form. I'm just telling you. This is called standard form because it often is used in place of slope intercept form. Mostly you use slope intercept form when you're uh, graphing and standard form when you're doing some kind of analysis. Okay, so this is called standard form. The formula for standard form is AX plus BY equals C where A and B are whole numbers, they're integers, and A is positive. I mean, there are all sorts of this and that and that and this about the, about the technicalities of standard form. It's really just enough for you to be able to recognize standard form, at least right now. And we're just gonna do the same thing. Determine whether the ordered pair is a solution of the given linear equation. That means it's a straight line. Remember how you know it's a straight line. The X and the Y are both raised to the one power. Linear equations always have both, both variables raised to the one power. OK, so I'm going to stick X equals 4 and Y equals 3 into this to see if I get a true answer. So 2 times 4 minus 3 equals 5. 2 times 4 is 8. Now I'm subtracting a positive 3. And that, I mean, I'm just really surprised to get two positives. You can't count, oh, oh, five equals five. You cannot count on that being true in your um, homework. That because I got two trues in a row that you're going to, because they flip back and forth and change numbers. So anyway, yes, is this a solution? Well, I'm kind of surprised, but yes, it is. Eight minus three is five. If you're bored, I'm really sorry, but reviewing is necessary because not everybody remembers way back to beginning algebra. 
Some people have had a few years in between. All right, now we're going to graph. Woohoo! We're going to graph this equation right here. Okay. <clears throat> and so we're going to go over the X and Y table system for finding points and then plotting the points and then connecting the points. So this takes you step by step through the whole process, actually. So I think I'll actually leave this to you. You'll be doing this. And it takes you step by step through this. And we'll do one down here. Ah, here's another one that takes you through the steps. But it would be good to take you through the steps here myself as well, so you know how to answer. So we have a graph in, well, it's not even in good standard form here. The Y term is first, but it doesn't matter. Okay, graph the equation 6Y minus 5X equals negative 12 and identify the Y intercept. Now here's what they say. To graph an equation in which Y is not isolated, Y is not by itself, use the addition and multiplication principles to solve for Y. In other words, do what you do when you solve an equation. This will put the equation in slope intercept form right here. Okay, so let's do this and then we'll know how to answer. 6y minus 5x equals negative 12. Okay, I have to solve for y. This is the y term. So I have to get the y term by itself first, then I worry about the y. So I'm going to take the x term and I have to make it equal zero on this side. So I will add 5x to both sides. Oops. Now negative 5x plus 5x is the same thing as 5x minus 5x. It equals zero. So I'm left with 6y all by itself. Over here, I'm going to have negative 12, which is a constant term, and I'm adding it to 5x, but I'm not quite ready to divide yet. Instead, I'm going to say 6y equals. Now, remember when you add numbers, uh, it doesn't matter what the order is. So, I put a y there. X. I'm going to put the x term first, and then the negative 12 behind. Then I'm going to rewrite this because somehow I got very angled. Now I know the way I like it. How do they like it? Aha, okay. I now am going to divide both sides of the equation by six. But I'm not going to leave it that way because it really doesn't give me the information I need. I need to put this in slope intercept form. That's what's being asked. So I'm going to separate this into two fractions where 5x is on the top of the first fraction and then minus and then 12 is on the top of the second fraction. 
And then I'm going to put the denominator six under here and under here. And I'm getting angled again. So Y equals, now watch what I do. The five goes over the six. So I have five sixths X minus 12 divided by 6 is 2. So now I know what they're looking for. Okay, I kind of had to go through it myself. Here we go. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to add 5x to both sides. And they're very careful to put the 5x in front of the negative 12. And then they want you to put the fraction part, the slope, in parentheses here. So that's going to be 5 sixths. And then it says divide both sides by 6. Yes, yes. So this is going to be a 2. Now type an integer or a fraction. Thus the y intercept is. <coughs> the y intercept is always going to have a 0 in front. And then it's going to be negative 2. The sign always goes with the number behind it. That's your y-intercept. Notice it says write this as an ordered pair. Ordered pair and point mean exactly the same thing. So now it says find two other points that satisfy the equation. OK, well, here's my equation over here. They tell us that three works. OK, fine. Well, what about this? If X is zero. Well, anything times zero is zero. So we're going to have y equals negative two when x is zero. We already knew that. Good grief. Now, what would happen if y equals five six x minus two? And we have negative six here y equals 5, 6 times negative 6 minus 2. There are two ways to do this. You can do it by hand. Here's how you would do it by hand. y equals 5 over 6 times negative 6 over 1 minus 2. That's because this six and this six will cancel out. Six goes into six one time. Negative six goes into six negative one times. So this is going to give me y equals five times negative one is negative five over one times one, which is one minus two which will be y equals negative five minus two, which is y equals negative seven. Easy to make a mistake there. Negative five minus two is really, let me write this down. Negative five minus two is really negative five plus negative two. So all you have to do is add the negative integers. Five plus two is seven. 
negative 5 plus negative 2 is negative 7. Don't get this mixed up with the multiplication property. If you were multiplying negative 5 times negative 2, that would be positive 14, which might be, let's see, now that you see that, I need to erase it before somebody thinks that has something to do with this problem. That could be disastrous. Um, the calculator knows all of these rules and maybe you forget, so it's a good idea to use your calculator. If we have time at the end, I'll come back and do this in the calculator and you'll see it really helps you to get the right answer. All right, now we're going to move into functions. If you have the linear equation, whoops, y equals x plus 8. Well, that's a straight line. However, it, when we're using function notation, we write y as f of x and other letters than f can be used. But this is just a symbol that means y. It doesn't mean f times x. It's just a symbol that means y. But this is what this lets us do, which is kind of convenient. f of 0 means I put a zero in, ignore that. I didn't do that. That's your imagination. F of zero means I put a zero in for the X because this is always an X value. So F of X here is going to be F of zero equals 0 plus 8, which is 8. And so I put that over here. Now, this is always x, the number in the parentheses. The number you get over here is always y, which also means we're talking about the point 0, 8. They're not asking you for that, but I want you to know that. Now we're going to use f of negative 10. That's going to be negative 10 plus 8, which is negative 2. This is the x, this is the y. This is the point negative 10, negative 2. All of these are points that are on that line. Oops, I forgot to graph those points. Oh well, you do it. I'll come back to it if we have time. I just remembered that. F of negative six is going to equal negative six plus eight, which is positive two. Whatever number goes in here goes in for the X. Now I'm not going to do all of these for you. I am going to do this one. This is very interesting. So I'm actually going to start from the beginning. I'm going to write F of X equals X plus eight. Now, there's an X plus 20 in this parenthesis, set of parentheses. Doesn't matter. There's a rule that says whatever goes in the parentheses goes in for the X, period. And you don't argue about it. So, I'm going to take X plus 20 and put it in for the X. 
and then I add the plus eight. Well, that's going to give me X plus 28. When you have a problem like this, we're not talking about points. You're going to find out later that this is called composition of functions. And you have just composed a function. Well, you have composed, but it's called composition of functions. And you're going to find out kind of sloppy there. You're going to find out that X plus 20 is actually its own function. And it's just like F has eaten this function. But all that's for the future. Don't worry about it now. It's enough to know that whatever goes in the parentheses goes in for the X. The X. OK, now the very first thing you probably learned about functions. Is finding out if a graph is a function or not. OK, there is something called the vertical. Whoop, whoop, I jumped the gun there. The vertical line test. Which you may dimly remember or exactly remember. And this is what the vertical line test is. You draw a vertical line either physically or mentally through a graph. Better to do it at a number of different points. Just to make sure. And here's what we're making sure about. Does the vertical line, each vertical line, does it touch the graph at one point or at more than one point? These lines intersect the graph at one point, only one point. Let's see. Vertical line intersects graph the graph is the blue line intersects graph at only one point That makes this a function. This is the graph of a function. I could have just said yes. Okay, that's a function. Now, 
I do the same thing to this graph. Notice that if I draw a vertical line through that point, it does intersect the graph at only one point. So if I only look at that point, I might think this is a function, which is why you want to do at least mentally draw your vertical lines at more than one point on the graph. Because here, this line intersects the graph at two points, two. Here, and here. It flunks the vertical line test. OK, ver vertical line. Intersects graph. Intersects. No, no. Intersects graph at more than one point. Specifically at two points. It flunks, oh dear, it flunks. The VLT, the vertical line test. Kind of sounds like a sandwich, doesn't it? A BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Mm, yum, I'm hungry. Okay, so it flunks the VLT. What does that mean? It means it's not a function. Nope. not a function. Well, let's talk about the real reason why. I'm going to erase, whoa, those Y values. Um, I need something that's a little easier to measure. No, not there. How about here? Yeah. So I can tell you why. Why this is a good test. That's how college algebra is different from other algebra classes. Uh, you actually go into the reasons why. OK, it looks to me like, let's see, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4 on the x-axis, and maybe 1 half on the y-axis. So this point would be negative 4, 1 half. And this point would be negative four, negative one half. About. But on the other hand, if I come up here, this is negative one here on the x-axis. Negative one, and this is at one, two, three, four, five, six on the y axis. So this point on the graph is negative one, six. Now, if we were to compare the two, I would have to say that I know I 
I know that x equals negative one is matched. with y equals 6. There is no doubt in my mind, negative 1 is definitely matched with y equals 6, period. On the other hand, look down here. Negative 4 is matched with two numbers, two different numbers. If I want negative four to be matched with one half, well, negative one half will jump up and say, me too, me too. And if I want negative four to be matched with negative one half, then positive one half says, me too, me too. It's enough to drive you crazy. Everybody who has more than one child knows exactly that situation. This is a very indefinite situation. Mathematicians want their answers to be definite, which is why functions are the preferred form of, in math you would say mathematical object, but in real life, just say, call it a math thing. A function is a math thing, okay? I have one answer. If I ask a question, I get a definite answer. I don't have any me too, me too going on. So, therefore, functions are preferred. So there. And that's the difference between a function and a non-function. So just real quickly, we're going to talk about these two graphs. And you can probably now tell immediately what the difference is. If I draw a vertical line here, it goes through the graph at two points. It intersects the blue graph at two points, not a function. Cool. Okay. On the other hand, this looks like it couldn't possibly be a function because it's so complicated. This kind of sawtooth graph, but you know what it is? Because everywhere you draw a vertical line, even if you draw it off grid, your line is only going to intersect the graph at one point. The vertical line intersects the graph at one point, no matter where you draw it. So this actually ends up being a function. Okay, the vertical line test, very important. Now here we have a couple of general graphs. And, and you know how to read a graph probably, but we're gonna work on this. The graph shown below approximates the number of children in a country 
who lived with only their grandparents in the years from 1991 to 2009. The number of children is a function of the year X. That is, in 91, you had that many millions of children living with grandparents. Um, in 2009, you had this many children living with grandparents. Incidentally, these numbers are not true. Uh, that's why they say in a country. OK, they just made it up to make a graph. OK, uh, when it is real, when it's really based on real stuff, <clears throat> you usually see um, a source of the information written down below. That's how you know for sure. OK, well, we're being asked to approximate the number of children living with only grandparents in 2004. That is, find F of 2004. First, see that F right there? That F is the graph. Really would have been better to write it here. Whatever math you have making a graph, this is it. And a picture of that is on here. Okay, now in 2004, that's going to be between 2003 and 2005. It's going to be right here. To find out an approximate number of the children living just with grandparents, I go up to the graph. OK, I smash into it right there. Then I go over to the Y axis. Woo! I go over to the Y axis and I end up on 2.0, which means 2 million. So that's what I would put over here. The number of children living with only grandparents in 2004 is well, that's a 2.0, so I would probably say 2 million, but if I want to be fancy, I might say 2.0. Same kind of thing here. The following graph approximates the number of pharmacists in a country in the years from 2002 through, to, through 2012. The number of pharmacists is a function G of the year. This time they're calling the function G. Okay, fine. I don't care. It's a function of X. The function G of the year X. Okay, approximate a num the number of pharmacists in 2008 right here okay so go uh to the graph and go over to the y-axis and you get 290 what does 290 mean 290 in thousands 290,000 OK, 290,000. The approximate number of pharmacists in a country in 2008 was approximately 290. And they give you the thousands, so you don't have to put the thousands in there. In fact, they did this in both both problems. They wrote out the thousands for you, so all you had to do was write 290. And they wrote out the millions for you, so all you had to write was 2 or 2.0. Oh, and there are the answers. We won't go there. All right, let's go back here. Where I apparently did not finish what I started. OK, for instance, I found out what? That if X is negative 6, 
y is negative 7. Well, we're going to check and see if I'm right. We're going to have the points. Let me write them over here. Uh, 0, negative 2. Six three and negative six, negative seven. If I made an arithmetic error, they will not all line up in a in a, in a straight line. Aha. Okay. So let's see. Zero negative two is right here. Six. 3 is right here. Negative 6, negative 7. All right, here's negative 7. And there's negative 6. So, negative 6, negative 7. Yes, they line up. Okay. best I can do. Let me save that. Okay, what did I miss, if anything? Um, what is a good first step to isolate y on the left side of the equation? And so what I did was I added 5x to both sides. So that would be what I would click on on my math lab. Okay, well. This is one of those rare occasions when we're out early. So, I can sit here and be the answer lady. <laughs> 